8.25 a.m. Landon had told the workers to come to the lower region earlier than usual. He wanted them to load up the tools for land mapping into the loading trucks and head out to District D. Within this week, Landon wanted all 5,000 men to learn everything about road construction. Hence, he decided to use this week as training time for the men. And although they were usually given two days off within a week, Landon wanted them to work all seven days straight, just for this time frame. Of course, they would definitely be paid extra for their overtime. After their training week, Landon would then divide them into different groups based on the different jobs within road construction. Some would be in charge of land excavation, leveling the land, digging up trenches for road water drainage, gravel adding, tarring, and so on. For now, this week would be used to familiarize the workers with every part of road construction. He also decided to start with the street roads around the residences, instead of the highways slash major roads. Firstly, the main highway road in Baymard is currently used very often. The soldiers and horses use on them daily to leave from the upper region to their posts by the gates and other areas within Baymard. Carriages, wagons, and other supply trucks also use these roads to supply bags of food to the stores, military, schools, and so on. Hence, there was no point in starting with them now. Plus, highway roads were really stressful to create. There might be a possibility that Baymard would be overpopulated and filled with numerous cars in the future. Hence, Landon would also need to make highway road bridges within the city. Back on Earth, all cities had road bridges. If one wanted to head over to the mall, downtown, or any congested area, there were lanes on bridges that took one around traffic and so on. These bridges were usually supported by large pillars and were a must in lessening car accidents, aiding in traffic control, and so on. And although most of the highway roads would be on ground level, Landon couldn't deny the amount of stress highway bridges would cause him. Therefore, anything highway would definitely be done last. Once they were in the District E, Landon and the men began to offload the trucks. They had brought paint, several two-meter-long iron rods, ropes, measuring tapes, and so on. Today, they were going to focus on mapping out the roads. The topography for the central and upper regions were really superb for construction. Both had what geography would call a plain topography. Plains were flat sweeping landmasses that generally didn't change much in elevation. They usually occurred at the doorstep of mountains or by any coastal region. And one should know that at the back of Landon's castle in the upper region was a huge, unexplored mountain range. And the coastal region was also very close to the central region. Hence, both the upper and the central regions were basically plains. These regions were like clear green football fields, or clear safari fields where animals grazed openly in Africa. One could say that they looked like parks for kite flying. Clear, green, and perfect for construction. The grass in these regions were only ankle level and really less stressful compared to the lower region that was filled with rocks and trees. Of course, there were trees in these regions as well, but they spread wide apart, as opposed to a densely packed jungle. Imagine several football fields that had only one or five trees on each field. That's how these regions looked like. But having this kind of topography wasn't always a blessing. Landon realized that if he wanted to make a national park in future, he would need to plant several trees within District G. What a drag! Landon placed a two-meter iron rod in the ground at the left side of the entrance slash exit from the upper region. This rod would indicate the starting point for District D. E. All right. So far, all of you have your road map planned for this district in your hands. For the next two days, we will all map out some of the roads using this rod and the carriage road as our reference points. Landon and the men immediately got to work. His Highness said that every after 168 meters, 550 feet, we need to make roads that leave the main carriage highway and lead to the, the residential roads within the district. You're right. I think His Highness said that these spaces were called city blocks. So what we need to do now is mark up all the roads, as well as block areas. Right? Correct. The men discussed amongst themselves as the work progressed. Generally, city blocks shouldn't be too long or too short. If it was too long, the pedestrians wouldn't feel safe. And when they were walking, they would feel like they weren't making any progress at all towards their destinations. That's why back on Earth, people didn't really approve of the block sizes of several places like Manhattan that had a block size with length 246 feet and a width of 900 feet. The people felt like it was too long and not safe. Plus, there were really no shortcuts around the blocks. On the other hand, smaller blocks weren't always better either. Portland City in the USA was the darling of road blocks and had a block length of 200 feet, as well as a width of 200 feet. 
That city offered short blocks and had a lot of shortcuts for those without cars. But on the downside, those with cars were constantly annoyed by these short blocks. The smaller the blocks, the more time those driving spend on traffic lights, which in turn makes them late for important engagements. Plus, on an economical point of view, as block size shrinks, more street roads would be made. Street roads cost money to maintain, as opposed to a retail-occupied land which generated tax revenue yearly from electrical bills and so on. Hence, Landon decided to make his own blocks to be an average of the two comparisons. For the residential areas, Landon decided to that the city blocks should have a length of 223 feet, 68 meters, and a width of 550 feet, 168 meters. After lunch, Landon felt like they had marked more than enough blocks along the carriage highway. So he divided the men into three groups. 2,000 of them were to continue marking the roads along the carriage road. Another 2,000 were to take each marked road and start marking their way across the fields and further into the district. And finally, 1,000 of them were to start marking the spaces along the already marked roads for rainwater drainage pipes, as well as water supply pipes and sewage drainage pipes. As the work progressed, Landon was happy with how much work these 5,000 men had accomplished. Landon knew that he wouldn't be here the next day, so he instructed the workers on what areas he wanted marked while he was away. Tomorrow, he needed to supervise the first official military exam for the May recruits. But for now, it was 3 p.m., and he had a date with Department C6. Time to teach the electrical engineers and training about how to make light bulbs. When Landon got to the lower region, he immediately went to the Department C2 glass and loaded a truck with already cut glass tubes and bulbs, as well as seven oven light kills for heating. There were several shapes presently made, large long tubes, small long tubes, short spiral tubes, and so on. Prior to this month, Landon had already known that he would make light bulbs for the new industries. Hence he requested for the glass department to make tons of these tubes. Fluorescent lights are generally long-lasting and best for schools, industries, homes, hospitals, and so on. Although incandescent light bulbs were way more inefficient and short-lasting than fluorescent bulbs, they can still be used in residential houses. Since they wouldn't last long, it was clear to see that they would be cheaper than fluorescent bulbs, although not by a lot. People always choose cheaper items first, even if the difference between the two items was by a penny. Hence Landon still had to make these bulbs for those who wanted to value quantity over quality. One incandescent light bulb could last for only 1,500 hours, but the latter could last for more than 10,000 hours. Once Landon reached Department C6, he realized that this department needed more buildings. Department C6 alone occupied for buildings. But right now, Landon decided to add another building for the department, which would be designated for the creation of light bulbs. Speaking of which, Landon realized that the construction industry was quickly running out of space. Previously, there were 13 departments that already occupied 16 buildings within the construction industry. But now, he added a new department for tissue paper and a new building towards Department C6. With those out of the way, the construction industry had no more massive and used buildings left. There were just seven wide, one-story buildings that were previously used as sleeping quarters for the maids, slaves, and servants. Off the bat, those seven slave buildings could only be used as storage units. So if Landon wanted more space, he would just have to construct more buildings or create a new industry for whatever he wanted to create. Looking at the electrical engineers and training, Landon realized that he couldn't just pull them all out as they were still needed in creating heavy machines at Building 4 of Department C6. Hence, he decided to break them in into two groups and alternate teaching them daily. Today, he would teach Group 1, while the other group would carry on with their usual duties. And the next day, he would focus Group 2. In addition, by the end of the week, Landon would assign specific people amongst them to continue light bulb production. He just wanted to teach them all, as it was beneficial for their education as electrical engineers. Plus. Some of them might even end up as repair men when maintenance is needed, so it was best for them to understand everything as much as possible. The men offloaded the tubes from the trucks gently, lest they broke, and carried them into their new building. Landon had the men set up the room as a lecture hall and also placed all the materials in front of them. Today, we'll create long fluorescent light tubes, and the day after that, I'll show you all how to make compact fluorescent bulbs. And later on, we'll make incandescent bulbs as well. In addition, next month, I will continue on by teaching you all how to create halogen and LED light bulbs. But for this month, let's concentrate on the first three, fluorescent tubes, fluorescent bulbs, and incandescent bulbs. 
Speaking of which, Landon couldn't wait to make LED lights. Those ones could last for more than 50,000 hours and were widely used back on Earth by 80% of all the industries, schools, and so on. Those ones took time to make, hence Landon postponed them for next month. The men wore their safety wear, and they sat in the classroom quietly. Question. For electricity to work, what do we need? Immediately, several hands were raised at once. Landon smiled. For the past three months, every Saturday was used as lecture day. Landon would teach them for three hours and give them weekly assignments to complete. Yes, Christopher. A young man in his early 20s got up instantly. There needs to be a supply of electric charges, some form of push to move the charges, and a pathway to carry the charges. Correct. Everyone clapped. Usually what push system is used in electricity? Cathode anode push system. The cathode is positively charged and the anode is negatively charged, making the electrons flow freely between two points. Another answered. What are the types of current flow? Static. Someone answered. Good guess. But no. That is a type of electricity. What I asked for was the current flow, who else? AC and DC. That's alternating and direct current flow. Correct. Now hold the larger glass tube in front of you all and let's begin. Each person held the large glass tube in front of them and followed Landon's lead. Landon took out his own glass tube and passed white phosphor liquid through the clear transparent tube, instantly coating it white. Phosphor was a chemical that could cause the bulbs to basically glow brightly. This kind of glow could be green, pink, white, blue, and so on. After the workers had their own tubes coated, they immediately started taking notes on the importance of phosphor coating. Landon then went on to the next phase. It was time to start with the internal workings of the bulbs, specifically the electrical components. Landon took coiled tungsten wires and placed them at both ends of a smaller glass tube that was on his table. The mouth of smaller tube was heated so as to melt the glass around the tungsten wire, hence forming a glass mold around the wire. As the lecture progressed, the men began to note the importance of other coating chemicals like barium that was used along the wire. At the end, tubes were filled with mercury, argon, and nitrogen gases, as well as other important tube components. These gases all had different uses, like argon that is useful for extending the life slant of the light tubes. At the end of the day, Baymard had successfully created their first batch of fluorescent tubes. 8.45 a.m. The morning dew could be seen dancing on the grass as the bright golden rays of sun shone on the fields. Within the military grounds, several men stood at attention on the fields as they anxiously waited for the examinations to begin. The military examination was a week-long one. Day 1. Separate theory exams on military rules, weapons, safety, and pino grammar. Day 2. Physical exam on physical combat and gun firing. Day 3. Theory on scenario questions which were still based on war tactics, code of ethics, and military sign language. Day 4. Separate theory exams on geography, land mapping, first aid, and mathematics. Day 5. Obstacle course, push-ups, frog jumps, and so on. Day 6. Sword fighting and cannon firing. Day 7. Rock climbing. Generally, the theory exam was 50% of the final exam, and the physical was also 50%. Today was the second day for the exams, and also the only day that Landon had to supervise the examination. All physical exam marking sheets graded the recruits based on bravery, task completion, perseverance, knowledge, strength, flexibility, and so on. Mustafa was standing nervously on the exam ground with his friends. Although he was sure that he was ready, a part of him couldn't calm down. He felt butterflies all over his tummy and couldn't help but tap his boots as he waited. He looked at his friend, who in turn M kept staring at the ground while being lost in thought. Everyone was nervous. Once Mustafa saw His Highness Landon, he knew that it was finally time. Landon, Lucius, the major generals, captains, and the rest of the warrant soldiers who were also supervising the exam, walked towards the field. Once the recruits saw Landon, they knelt down and gave him there. You may all rise. Today is your second examination day, and I'm sure that a lot of you are nervous. But there is no need to be. I, alongside the other soldiers, have seen you train and grow daily. Today, we will be testing your combat and gun firing skills. Both exams will go on at the same time for the entire day. Hence, we will divide you all into groups of two. Once you finish taking one exam, go and line up for the other. All of you have taken the first four written exams and can already gauge how much effort you need to put towards your next exams. Work hard. And I wish all the best. 
As Mustafa heard Landon speak, he became even more determined to pass today's exams. Out of the four theory exams yesterday, he was sure that he would pass only three of them. Hence, he began to feel an invisible weight on his shoulders. He had to make sure that he successfully passed the rest of his exams, and with a good grade too. Mustafa was placed in the first group, physical combat. There were 20 stages set on the fields, and more than 60 warrant officers, as well as Captain Trey, Major General Josh, and Gary, were supervising this particular exam. From what Musiafa understood, His Highness would be shuttling back and forth between both exam grounds for the entire day. Mustafa and his comrades formed two lines along each battle stage. As he waited, he began to observe the people fighting on all 20 stages. Bro, you're up next after this fight. Are you ready? His friend asked. Truth be told, his heart was pounding vigorously, and his palms became sweatier. Bro, I'm not too sure, now that I'm next. Breathe in and take your time. You'll be fine. As they finalized their conversation, they heard people clapping. The match on the stage had ended, and it was finally his turn. The rules of the battle were simple. Successfully kick the other person off the stage before seven minutes elapsed. Of course, if both participants were still on stage after that time frame, then it would be considered a tie, and both participants would get a pass grade for the exam. Mustafa rubbed his sweaty hands with powdered chalk that was placed in large bowls by stage and proceeded up. He and his opponent saluted each other, took their battle stances, and waited for the start signal. Begin, an invigilator yelled. Instantly, both of them ran towards each other as they began their attacks. His opponent immediately slid on the floor expectantly and tripped him down. Bang! As he fell, his opponent quickly rolled away, stood up. Feeling the impending crisis, he too got up as well. His opponent then ran and jumped towards him, with both legs flying in the air, and aimed towards his upper chest region. SH asterisk T. His opponent was going to do a drop kick on him. To counter the attack, he quickly pushed his opponent's floating legs upwards and circled his left hand around his opponent's waist. He was going to do the backbreaker. He instantly dropped to the floor in a kneeling position and hit his opponent's back against his knees. Ah, his opponent cried. The fight went on. And when it was almost seven minutes straight, he was literally rolled out of the stage by his opponent. He felt like crying. He had really lost. Add. Just a few seconds more and he would have qualified for a tie with his opponent. Why was he so unlucky? Although he lost, he didn't hold any grudge towards his opponent. He was actually surprised that he had held on that long with a fighting monster like that. His opponent had far superior fighting skills than he did. Hence, losing to him didn't take his dignity away as a soldier. Hi, I'm George. Honestly, you gave me a hard time up there. I think that we are pretty much even in strength. Mustafa turned around and saw his opponent whom he had lost to. He smiled. He knew that George was just saying all this, so as to cheer him up. After all, he had lost. Nah, I think you have better battle sense, and no more fighting moves than I do. Speaking of which, how come your brain buster move is better than mine? They chatted as they made their way towards the other examination ground. Mustafa thought that he had failed that particular exam. But what he didn't know, was that most of the examiners had given him a good score. After all, completing the task was just one of the criterias. He had executed a lot of moves, as well as fought with all his might. And although his stances for most of the moves needed more work, he had definitely been able to get all the moves at least 60% right. The recruits didn't know how they were graded, so those that lost thought that they had definitely failed this particular exam. It was done this way, so that Landon and the invigilators could see the true colors of the men. Passing was important, but how you passed mattered as well. If there were people who deliberately went overboard with the fights just so they could win, those people would fail the course whether they finished the fight or not. All the moves that the men were taught had their safety zones. When using these moves on comrades, the men were to attack the body zones that wouldn't leave any permanent or serious injury to their opponents. If anyone intentionally broke his, her comrade's spine, neck, or body parts, they would be expelled from the military ASAP. But if it was accidental, then they only get a probation period to reflect on their actions. Everything in the world was dangerous had its safety zones. Working in a chemical lab, hospital, or even driving was dangerous. But if done safely, then there would be nothing to worry about. But if someone intentionally blinded a co-worker with chemicals, or gave the wrong drug prescription, or even killed someone while driving, then they had to take accountability for their actions. Even if it was a mistake, they would still be held responsible to some degree in boxing, karate, or even wrestling. If a person broke another's jaw, 
spinal cord, or shattered his opponent's ribs. They might be suspended or even banned for life. Every profession had its safety zones. And the military was no exception. All the men had been taught on safety right from the get-go. So Landon wasn't going to pardon anyone. It's either expulsion or probation. But when the men were attacking enemies, TSK, they could do whatever they wanted. At that point, even if they broke their enemy's nostrils, neck, or even fingers, Landon wouldn't give two Fs about the whole scenario. That was the only time that he would allow them to run rampant. The exam progressed and finally, it was the end of another beautiful day for Landon. And the end of another hellish examination day for the recruits. On the previous day that Landon had supervised the military exam, the construction workers had continued on marking the roads and had also marked each residential home on the blocks. Today was dedicated towards excavating the marked roads, digging up space for rainwater drainage, water supply, central heating, and sewage pipes. If rainwater or melted snow wasn't drained, the roads and sidewalk pavements would become flooded. When that happened, the pavement grade would definitely decrease as well as the lifespan of the pavement. The central heating pipeline, on the other hand, ensured that all buildings and houses were properly heated during the winter. It would also provide ventilation and air conditioning to all buildings within Baymart. All four pipelines, rain, sewage, clean water, and central heating, would be placed under the roads. Underneath the left lane of the road would be the sewer pipeline, as well as the water supply pipeline. And below the right lane of the road would be the rainwater drainage pipeline. As for the central heating pipeline, it would be placed underneath the center of the road. Just like how it was done back on Earth, all four pipelines were placed underneath the road and buried at different depths. In the case of a single lane road, all pipelines would still be placed underground. But their pipe sizes would be much smaller compared to that of a two or even a six lane road. For rainwater drainage, the sidewalks along the roads would have what was usually called a catch basin. These basins would be placed periodically on both sides of the road, underneath the sidewalks. Every after a certain distance, a catch basin would be seen draining the water away from the roads. Their job was to gather all the water on the sides of the road and pipe it to the main pipeline directly underneath the roads. All street rainwater pipelines would lead to all highway pipelines and travel down towards the coastal region, particularly District K. At this point, Landon had realized that he needed to build a mini-estate that would focus on filtering out dirt from the water before it went to the ocean. Roadside water drains could sometimes catch cans, plastic wraps, banana peelings, oil spills from cars, coins, and so on. With all this happening, the ecosystem and marine life had to be protected. Plus, he didn't want all those bottles, plastic wraps, and cans to wash up the shores of Baymart. It was just not beach sexy. Hence, before the water went into the ocean, it needed to pass through a filtering plant. District K was a great location for the filtration plant. It was between District J, Beach Resorts, and District L, Navy, and other armed forces. Who would like to turn up to a beach resort that had bottles and cans floating in the ocean? On the other hand, the sewage pipelines would also be directly underneath the left lane of all roads. Sewage was a tricky one. 90% of sewage systems worked with the help of gravity meaning that the pipes had to slope downwards from their source sinks, toilets, etc., to the wastewater treatment plant. Luckily for Baymart, the treatment plant was in the lower region. The upper region generally had a high elevation point to the central region. And the central region in turn had a slightly higher elevation point than the coastal region. But the lower region had the lowest elevation point in Baymart, which was what Landon needed. In this way, all the waste would flow downhill with ease. Gravity was needed because wastewater generally had a lot of solids in it, which made pumping a plane in the butt. There was tissue paper, bones from the sink, seeds from fruits, that would end up in the pipes, making it very hard to pump. But although pumping was stressful for sewage, it was still very much possible. If there were areas that needed poop to travel over hills, grinded pumps or lift stations would be used to pressurize the poop. The lift stations literally pushed the sewage up the hills, to a needed height where they could gravity flow downwards again. So in the ideal situation, pipes from each house would connect to a main sewer pipe underneath the road and flow downhill by gravity. And now that the men had marked out each residential unit around the blocks, they now knew how many residential sewage pipelines would branch out from the main sewage pipeline underneath the road. There would also be manholes placed periodically along the pipes. These manholes would act as access points, should in case a problem arises in the sewer pipeline. For example, if a toddler had a bad habit of frequently flushing down his toys in the toilet, 
there might be a clog over time with the sewer pipelines. When that happened, the workers would have to use these manholes and unclog the area. And aside from sewers, rainwater pipelines would also have manholes as well. Once Landon and the men arrived at the road site, they immediately got on the heavy machines and began work. When they had their driving classes months ago, they had been thoroughly taught how to install all these piping units, and had also done so when they were constructing the other three industrial sites. With months of experience under their belt, they immediately knew what to do when they looked at the piping plan. And for the next three days, some people used excavators to dig up the ground, others placed the pipes with the hell of drag lines and other heavy machines. Some leveled the ground with bulldozers, while others compacted the ground with compactors, rollers. And since there were not enough machines for 5,000 people, those that weren't driving either jumped down into the trench and guided those who were on the machines placing the pipes, screwed the pipes together, continued marking the land, and so on. At the end of the day, there was a job for everyone on site. On the sixth and seventh day of the week, they completely tarred the roads using the pavers, spreaders, and other heavy machines. Finally, they were done. Well, almost done. Although training week was over, Landon still added two more days for teaching. The tar on the road would only take a day at most to dry, so while it was drying, the men did the sidewalks. And once it was finally dried, road marking heavy machines were used to paint the roads. The white painted lines usually differentiated each lane, bicycle paths, traffic lines, pedestrian crossing lines, and so on. When everything was done, Landon could finally close his lessons on road construction. Of course, he had made up his mind that at least two days a week, he would come over to assist them, as well as check up on their work. Before Landon left, he divided the men into two main groups. The first group would continue working on the residential roads within District E, while Group 2 would start installing the main highway pipelines and connecting them to the coastal or lower regions. Unlike the others, the main highway pipelines were not going to be placed beneath any highway road. They would be placed at the sides, hence the men didn't need to necessarily touch the roads. They just had to place the pipes alongside all highway roads and connect them to the coastal region or the plants in the lower region, depending on what pipeline it was. On the city plan, there were three main highway roads within the district. Two had three lanes, while the last one had six lanes. Landon needed the men to start working on those pipelines now. At the end of the day, even if house or road construction within the district was done, if these pipelines weren't connected to the coastal or lower regions yet, then nothing would be supplied or drained. No clean water, no heating, no sewage drainage, no rainwater drainage. Nothing. Landon really wanted to get things done before it started snowing. In Baymart, snow usually started in the early days of December and sometimes in the later days of November. Landon's plan was to get the original Baymart citizens all housed up before then. And at that time, all these features needed to be fully installed and working within in their homes. Right now, Landon really wanted to finish this housing mission. But he also knew that Baymard's housing plans couldn't be rushed either. For the system's mission to be completed, he needed to successfully house all the original citizens of Baymard. Sigh. Long story short, time was money, and he needed the citizens to be safe for the winter. Hence, those pipelines needed to be installed ASAP. While Landon jumped from one industry to the other, the royals and nobles in the capital were perplexed over the lateness of one particular noble. Everyone just had one question in mind. Where the hell was City Lord Shannon? Royal Palace, capital of Arcadena. Over the past week, all those involved with the border war had finally arrived at the capital. All except one. Everyone was puzzled about what could have delayed the mighty war god. King Barn, his three sons, some court ministers, and the city lords that would participate in the upcoming the border war were gathered around the throne room. In four more days, all the men would be heading out towards the border cities that had been conquered by the Deiferous Knights. There were currently five groups dedicated for taking back each border city. And each group had one commander and three generals for the war. In some groups, the princes would act as commanders and have the other city lords within their group act as generals. And in others, a city lord was appointed to act as commander. The men had positive attitudes towards this war. They felt that they were more in number compared to their enemies. With each man having at least 5,000 knights under his command, victory was definitely assured. All through the day, they had been going over their battle plans and strategy. And now that their meeting was coming to an end, something had to be said about City Lord Shannon. You're sure that you had previously sent out my orders? My king, I'm most certain. Perhaps something happened along the way that caused his delay? My king, 
We can't continue to wait for him any further. He's right, my king. Our cities are being stolen by those animals. My king, may I suggest that we replace city lord Shannon with someone else who's currently residing within the capital? Alec Barn fell silent for a while. The whole charade made him feel uncomfortable. Whenever there was an important battle taking place, it was usually Shannon who arrived earlier than others. This was really puzzling. Why hadn't he shown up yet? As City Lord Shannon was popularly known within the capital, many young knights looked up to him for his strength. They had heard of his amazing battle skills and the amazing wars that he had fought alongside King Barn back in the days. Although the people in the capital feared King Barn, they had loads of respect for City Lord Shannon. In their mind, he should have been their king instead of Alec. Actually, the people were simple-minded and would generally prefer anyone who was kinder to them and better than Alec Barn. In addition, because of the way the people thought of Shannon, Shannon himself had been planning to dethrone Alec ages ago. That was until he died at Landon's hands. He had planned the whole scenario with his eldest son, Martyr. Martyr was to get close to the royal princesses as well as gradually gain the support of the people. He himself was to gather his forces slowly and even by some of the knights in the royal castle. He had planned to make a deal with Alec's personal guards, who in turn were to poison or aid him in killing Alec. Everything was going as planned. Up until he met Landon, he had ended up dying at the hands of his enemy's bastard son. And as he died, he couldn't help but feel resentful. Couldn't he have at least died at the hands of Alec, the crown prince, or someone important? As a person of great status, wasn't it a stain to his name if people heard that he was defeated by sickly bastard? People went down in history as war heroes, but no. He just had to end up being a stepping stone for the bastard. Alec Barn had always known of the people's thoughts about Shannon. Ever since they were still knights training at the Knight Academy, Shannon had always had a better image in the capital compared to him. Shannon was very charismatic, gentle and kind to all the ladies and nobles around. The stupid people in the capital actually believed that bullshit acting of his. Alec didn't blame Shannon at all for his acting. Power play was indeed about keeping up appearances. In this day and age, those who acted like White Lotus, heroes and so on, easily won the hearts of the people. The people were sheep that needed a shepherd to guide them. They only listened and obeyed. And if anyone could convince them, then they could even give up their lives for that particular shepherd. Truly a stupid bunch. Alec himself used to pretend while he was in the academy. But after he killed his family, who would stand in his way again? He had become king and was the lawmaker. Who did he need to keep on airs with? Alec knew that Shannon wasn't as pure as he would like the people in the capital to believe. In the western regions, Shannon was known as Blood Knight. Over there, the people were completely frightened by Shannon. He acted like a bandit and did whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted to. He killed sometimes for fun and tortured innocent people when things didn't go his way. This was a man who had reportedly killed three of his wives once. He had burned villages down just because he missed the sight of blood or whenever he was enraged. Shannon also had one of the largest harems in the entire empire. He had kidnapped and raped countless women ever since he became city lord. Some of these women were stolen from their husbands and families. The sad part of it all was that some had their husbands and children burnt or buried alive since Shannon didn't want his new wives to miss their old families. The thought of another man having anything to do with his wives completely irked him. Hence he went after their families, towns or villages. When Alec was king, he immediately shipped Shannon out to the western regions, which had the worst conditions within the empire. He also stationed several nobles around the western region to monitor Shannon's movements. If Shannon was seen making his way to the capital, secret messengers would be sent to deliver messages to Alec. But after 15 years, nothing had happened. Hence Alec dropped his guard down. But for some reason over the recent years, he had been getting overly suspicious of Shannon. Shannon would now frequently make trips to the capital and would also do things that garnered support from the peasants. He had decided to use this war as an opportunity to kill Shannon. The other city lords within Shannon's team were supposed to team up and kill him after they had won the border war. But now, Shannon hadn't showed up yet. Did he know of their plans way beforehand? Was he planning a revolt? Alec's mind was racing back and forth. It was indeed the perfect time to revolt. The princes were all leaving and most of his strongest city lords would join them as well. Did Shannon build up his forces in secret? And if so, how many men did he really have under his command? Although there were still barons and ministers in the capital who had their own armies, how could Alec be sure that they wouldn't stab him in the back as well? None of them really cared for him, and would even be pleased if he actually died. 
Plus, even with his personal army, he couldn't guarantee his win since he didn't know how many men his enemy had. For the first time in his life, he began to regret his decision of ruling the people with fear. Shannon, oh Shannon, he, are you really going to bite the hand that fed you? Alec raised his right hand up in the air, and the room became silent. They had been talking and arguing about who would be the new commander for Shannon's team. Since City Lord Shannon isn't here right now, City Lord Campbell will take over his position as commander. Also, Baron Unicy within the capital will join the group, so as to even out the members between each group. Alec then turned to two of the guards at his side and issued out a command. This chapter's initial release occurred on the N0 V3 Elb 1 in sight. Get Shannon's son, Martyr, to see me at once.